Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this week's online service for St. Kenneth's Parish Church. Welcome, if you have been with, it, with us since we began in lockdown. Welcome, if you've been with us more recently. Welcome, if you perhaps alternate between being present in the buildings and being sometimes still online with us as well. It's good to have us all together as we worship God. Today we begin the season of Advent and as such we begin a new series of Sunday sermons which will focus on the names that are given by the prophet Isaiah to the coming Saviour in Isaiah chapter 9 that we'll read from shortly in our service. Because we're not doing this as we normally would in terms of being online, there is no lighting of an Advent candle at the moment, but you may, may wish to have a candle um, nearby. You may wish to pause the video and go and fetch a candle. And I will read this part of our call to worship, the little liturgy that I use in St Kenneth normally for our lighting the Advent candle. Today we light the first candle, the candle of hope. With Christians around the world we use this light to help us prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of God's Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. May we receive God's light as we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. They lived in a land of darkness, but now light is shining on them. Let us pray. Lord, as we look to the birth of Jesus, grant that the light of your love will help us to become lights in the lives of those around us. Prepare our hearts for the joy and gladness of your coming. For Jesus is our hope. Amen. Let us worship God. Let us pray. The anticipation of your coming seems strange this year, Lord, for we cannot celebrate as we normally would. Yet the truths of your word remain. We await the coming of a wonderful Saviour. So we bless you for the wonder of your grace. We bless you for the wonder of your mercy. We bless you for the wonder of your faithfulness. Our Advent journey is a pilgrimage of the heart, and so we will not be hindered from offering our praise from the deepest places of our souls. You are our counsellor, Lord, so we bless you for guiding us by your hand. We bless you for guiding us by the prompting of your Spirit. We bless you for your directing word. Our Advent journey is a pilgrimage of the heart, and so we offer all that we have and are that you might continue to lead us for your glory. Yet even as we worship you and dedicate ourselves to you, we must also come with our confession, for we've sometimes lost that sense of wonder at your power, for we've sometimes lost that sense of wonder at the reality that you would be present to us and with us, for we've sometimes failed to heed the counsel you have given us. Through the wonder of your love, please accept our confessions and indeed grant us your guiding spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. And now Steve Pimentel will bring to us our scriptures for this morning. 
The reading is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2, 6 and 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. And then Psalm 111. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Amen. What's in a name? Well, quite a lot, actually. It can be the case that our parents gave us our names for very particular reasons. I received my name Alan after my paternal granddad because I was born prematurely and when I was I was quite ill and my granddad had just come through a serious accident himself so mum and dad thought it would be good <clears throat> for me to be named after granddad and um be given that positivity of having his name. To include both sides of the family, I was given the middle name Peter. Of course, this name not only kept things in the family, but it is also a biblical name. Jesus himself, when speaking of the Apostle Peter, said, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Jesus here was speaking of Peter's faith and saying that the church would be built on that faith. So just maybe there was a perhaps an unintentional nod to what would lie ahead for me when I was also given the name Peter. Sometimes our names tell us something about what our parents hope for us in our lives. Any one of us might have been named after a particular family member to keep their memory alive and the hope of our parents might well have been that some of the characteristics which they exhibited in their lives would become true of us too. In our reading from Isaiah today, God gives us a glimpse through the prophet into all that he has in mind, all that he hopes for in his son Jesus. There are essentially four names given to Jesus in these verses, and we're going to use these Sundays of Advent to look at each of them. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So today we turn to Wonderful Counselor. By way of introduction, it's worth noting that in the original Hebrew, these words, these names, were completely separated. Therefore, we should look at each of them in turn, Jesus as Wonderful and Jesus as Counselor. As we ponder the Saviour to come as Wonderful, I want to ask a few questions. Firstly, when were you last filled with wonder? It is a sad fact and I think it is a fact that as we get older we lose that sense of wonder which children often have. We lead up to Christmas as a time when 
that's particularly in evidence as bright lights appear in the streets, as trees are decorated and, of course, as they anticipate a visit from Santa. But the challenge for us today is, God longs that we be caught up with that same sense of wonder when we allow our minds to dwell upon him and upon the Saviour. We might think of these famous words which we often sing under normal circumstances. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hand have made, I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Those words from the hymn, of course, how great thou art. It is one thing to be filled with wonder, and well one might be, as we look around at creation and absorb for ourselves all that God has made. But my second question is, has Jesus, through what he has done, caused you to respond in wonder? Allow yourself to ponder it again for a moment. Jesus came as the perfect, sinless Son of God to demonstrate just how much God loves us by ministering to our very real human needs, by dying a criminal's death upon the cross, and by rising again in glory, that we might live with him and with our Father forever. Those of us who've been around the church for any length of time have heard that message many times, but it is truly tragic if it has become a message which has become cold to us, to which we've grown cold. This Advent, we're invited again to look in awe and in wonder at Jesus. Let's seek to do that as his people. As we think of Jesus as wonderful, we're perhaps also drawn to the psalm which we read this morning. There in verse 2 we read, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in him. Do we make it our business to study the works of the Lord? For if we do, we will reach only one conclusion, that he is indeed wonderful. Secondly, this morning we look at particular reasons found in our psalm that describe why the Lord is wonderful. Verses 4 to 7 of the psalm say, He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. These verses tell us firstly that the Lord is wonderful because he is gracious and merciful. It is only as we accept the Lord's grace and mercy for ourselves that we will begin to realise just how wonderful he is. We might find ourselves singing another hymn, praise him for his grace and favour to our fathers in distress, praise him still the same forever. Slow to chide and swift to bless, praise him, praise him, glorious in his faithfulness. Have you accepted God's grace and mercy in Christ? This Advent, perhaps more than in any other in recent memory, we are grappling with many questions. When will this pandemic end? How will we celebrate a family Christmas? Or perhaps even, how will I get through yet another Christmas on my own? The way to know true contentment through this Advent season and on into Christmas is to accept the grace and mercy of God offered in Jesus. To do that is to answer the most important of Advent questions. Do we accept all of that from God? We discover secondly that the Lord is wonderful because he is faithful. Once again, in verse 7 of the psalm, the works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. That God is faithful means he will keep all his promises to us. 
and that he will ultimately never let us down. Can we say that of anyone else in our lives? I sincerely doubt it. For even the best of people are capable of letting others down because they are imperfect. So if you feel let down by life, as our Advent journey begins, trust again in the faithfulness of God seen most clearly in our wonderful Saviour. Finally this morning, let's think about Jesus as our counsellor. A counsellor, as we all know, is someone to whom we can turn when we are looking for wisdom or guidance, often concerning personal problems. And those who are trained in this field are to be highly valued. There are also Christian counsellors, those who help people to work through issues they face from a Christian perspective. That, of course, is an extremely abbreviated definition of what counsellors do. My apologies to counsellors everywhere. But the point about Jesus as our counsellor is that he is the perfect counsellor. He will always seek to guide us in ways which will be for our blessing, and he will never make a mistake in terms of the counsel he seeks to give us. Perhaps the most obvious place to look for a scriptural basis to Jesus' counsel is in what we know as the Sermon on the Mount, recorded for us in Matthew 5 through 7. I don't propose to examine the whole thing, you'll be relieved to hear. I indeed did that in smaller excerpts earlier in lockdown with our um, daily reflections as they were then. But for now, listen to this small excerpt. Therefore I tell you, says Jesus, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? Maybe I was drawn to that section of Jesus' teaching because I am a natural worrier. But whatever our disposition, we all worry from time to time. So, what is Jesus' counselling method here? He asks a question, probably designed to be rhetorical, which puts worrying into perspective. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to the span of your life? The short answer is, of course, no. But that doesn't mean we don't worry. As I've said before, most people in Jesus' day would have lived a day-to-day -day existence, and so it would have been natural for them to worry about things like food and clothing. Sadly, many today still have the very same concerns. But our calling as Christians is to see this teaching of Jesus as aspirational as well as inspirational. Even although we worry at the moment, we ought to aspire not to worry, even as we are inspired by the Lord who had total trust and confidence in the Father. As I draw my thoughts this morning to a conclusion, listen to these words from an anonymous author. Socrates taught for 40 years, Plato for 50, Aristotle for 40, and Jesus for only three. Yet the influence of Christ's three-year ministry infinitely transcends the impact left by the combined 130 years teaching from these men who were among the greatest philosophers of all antiquity. Jesus painted no pictures, yet some of the finest paintings of Raphael, Michelangelo and Leonardo da, Leonardo da Vinci received their inspiration from him. Jesus wrote no poetry, but Dante, Milton and scores of the world's greatest poets were inspired by him. Jesus composed no music, still Haydn, Handel, Beethoven, Bach, Mendelssohn reached their highest perfection of melody in the hymns, symphonies and oratorios they composed in his praise. 
every sphere of human greatness has been enriched by this humble carpenter of Nazareth. His unique contribution to the race of men is the salvation of the soul. Philosophy could not accomplish that, nor art, nor literature, nor music. Only Jesus Christ can break the enslaving chains of sin and Satan. He alone can speak peace to the human heart, strengthen the weak, and give life to those who are spiritually dead. This Advent, as we journey towards Christmas, we could look in many places and to many people as we seek guidance for the way ahead in our lives. But as this writer so beautifully observes, Jesus is uniquely qualified to be our counsellor and our wonderful saviour. So come to him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of his Holy Spirit. Amen. We come again to God in prayer, this time with our prayers of thanksgiving and of intercession. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you will come as the infant of wonder. We again give thanks for all that causes us to wonder even now. Your love, your grace, your mercy, your faithfulness. We give thanks that you will come as our perfect counsellor. We again give thanks for all the ways in which you counsel us, even now, through your word, by your spirit, through your people. Yet, Lord, even as we give thanks, we are so aware of the needs of our world, for which we come to pray in your name. Lord, we pray for children who have had their innocence stolen from them and who no longer wonder at life, those caught up in conflict and war in lands such as Syria, those caught up in illegal trafficking and trade, those who have been abused by others who should have loved them. Restore to them the wonder of your love. Lord, we pray for adults for whom the pressures of life in our frenetic world have caused them to lose their sense of wonder, the overworked and undervalued, those raising a family in poverty, the unemployed and desperate, Restore to them the wonder of your love. Lord, we pray for those who seek good, good counsel today, those with decisions to make about the future, church leaders across our nation and beyond, those involved directly in the fight against COVID-19, in our scientific community, our government and our health services. To your spirit's leading, we commit them. Finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves and those we love. For those who are ill, restore to them the wonder of your love. For those who are bereaved, restore to them the wonder of your love. For those who are perplexed and uncertain, to your Spirit's leading we commit them. Father, take our prayers and answer them, not merely according to our asking but according to your love and purpose for us and for all those for whom we've prayed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and lives and reigns with you, Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, blessed for ever. Amen. Once again, can I thank you for joining with us this morning and say that there will be a midweek musings around about Wednesday or Thursday of next week on Facebook and YouTube. But for now, may God restore to each and every one of you a sense of wonder at his love and an openness of heart to receive his perfect wisdom each day and forever. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon each and every one of you and all whom you love those with you now, those further afield, and those now at rest and gathered with their Maker, now and always. Amen.